Good morning, and this is uh, this week's edition of the People Progressing Podcast, and today I'm really excited, really, really excited to have Tommy Gilman on. Tommy is a, a Air Force cadet down at the United States Air Force Academy and a baseball player down there, and it's just had an unbelievable journey to get to where he's at, and it's going to be exciting to see and listen to what he has to offer today, and I, I know um, that we're going to get a lot out of this this edition of the People Progressing Podcast, and Tommy, I'm just really excited to have you on and just first want to start by you kind of introducing yourself and where you grew up and some of the things that you like to do as a kid and so forth. Awesome. Yeah, well, Coach White, first, thanks for having me on. Um, never done a podcast before, but I'm really excited for this and I wouldn't want to be on anybody else's. So um, <laughs> thanks for having me on. And I think what you do um, in terms of I would think your purpose is to help people and progress people. Um, hence the name. And I think that's really cool that that's your mission. So thanks for doing that. And thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's going to be great. So where, where did you grow up, Tommy? Did you, were you always in Littleton or did you move to Littleton when you were a kid? Yeah, I was always in Littleton. Um, my earliest memories uh, were when, when I was at our house near Columbine, um, literally like a minute away from Columbine. Um, and at that point, my dad was coaching at Columbine and I think my brother was just getting into high school then. Um, and then around like 2005 or six, I think we moved to the house I'm actually sitting at right now um, here in Littleton. It's kind of uh, overlooking Chatfield Reservoir. Um, cool little location. Um, but yeah, always been in Littleton and never really was too far from home growing up. What, what I know you played it football and baseball did you play basketball and stuff too what when you were so growing I, up all, all those sports that you played yeah growing up I actually played um I played baseball and basketball um and soccer mainly okay. growing up and then I played football once I got into high school um there's a it's actually kind of funny because when my brother started dating um his girlfriend and she would ask me like what sports I played when I was like six or seven or eight I would literally list like every single sport I could think of, like snowboarding, tennis, golf, whatever, if I had ever touched a piece of equipment for it. Um, and they always tell me that story because it's just like, <laughs> it's so silly, but it's really funny. Um, but really, I just played baseball, basketball and soccer growing up and then football when I got into high school, baseball and football in high school. Yeah. And you were um, the quarterback of the football team, weren't you? No. So. I played safety and then just Columbine traditional offense. We got a lot of dudes who can run yeah, and yeah. Um, I kind of switched between like fullback and wingback, but we had Jake Lowry, who was our quarterback. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, he's a stud. And then uh, Mikey Greibel, who's still playing. He was one of our main backs. Um, but yeah, I played safety um, and then was just one of our other backs that ran, but mostly safety. And, and then you played for your dad in baseball over at Columbine. What was that like? Um, that was awesome. Um, it definitely, I know there's a lot of father son relationships that don't go super well, um, in high school or in just coaching in general. Um, but me and my dad had a really good dynamic and so did my brother and my dad when he played for him. And there's definitely a lot of, I think, pressure that people put on themselves. If, you know, someone they, they live with, um, or one of their relatives is their coaches, um, but that was a really cool experience for me. And I definitely wouldn't have wanted it any other way. My dad taught me how to play the game. He taught me how to play it right. And it was easy playing for a coach who expected the best of people and wanted them to play the game right. Um, and I'm, I'm really appreciative for that. Yeah. And your dad, Chuck, Chuck Gilman is, is one of my mentors and he's one of my uh, guys that I, I've always looked up to as a coach. He's, he's one of the legends in Colorado coaching and, you know, you are fortunate to have not only him as your dad, but as your coach, you got, you got best of both worlds from that. And I know your mom's been very instrumental in your development too. What, what has she brought to you? Yeah, she, um, I don't think I realized it growing up just how strong of a person she is. Yeah. And, um, she's a freaking stud. Like the older I get, the more I realize it. Um, and I'm just so thankful that both my parents can come to all of my college baseball games. Like not everybody, not every player gets that. Um, and I always know they're there because my mom is always in the game yeah. saying something very baseball savvy. Like yeah. 
It doesn't matter what the situation is or what's happening. She'll say something and everyone's like, who's that mom? Like she knows what she's talking about. Um, and it's cool. Like she brings energy from the stands and, you know, sometimes you just, you find a role and then you stick with it. And, you know, my parents have always been good at that. And um, it's just really cool to always have them be at my games and stuff. You know, that was funny because last weekend I was at your games watching the Air Force play San Diego State and I was sitting next to your dad talking with your dad and your mom was sitting on the other side of your dad. And that was the first thing I noticed was some of the things that she was yelling out to you guys and how supportive she was not only to you, but to all the other players and so forth. So I, yep. I know I've talked with CJ a lot, your brother, and he I know how instrumental your mom has been in 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 all your guys in all of your kids' uh, families' lives. And so it, it's it's um it's great to have that in your life and everything else. And I know let's go back now into your childhood when you were nine, tell us what happened and tell us how um, you dealt with uh, dealing with cancer. Yeah. So first off to kind of piggyback off the strength of my mom and dad. Um, and this is something I didn't really think of at the time when I was sick, but I just, I think about it now when I'm older um, a lot and I can't even imagine what that was like for them um, because not only are they trying to work and like make sure they have the funds to pay for for me being sick but also like they're trying not to leave me alone and by myself while I'm getting all my chemotherapy and staying in the hospital and there was this small tiny couch in the hospital room that I would always be or in the hospital room that I was in and one of them would sleep on that couch every single night yeah. and like it helped me when, whenever I woke up and needed something. Um, and they just made a huge sacrifice and obviously any parent would, and they would do it a million times over again, but it wasn't something that I really appreciated when I was nine years old and looking yeah. back on it now, it's, it's just, they did a really good job. I mean, obviously there was a lot of moving parts, a lot of pressure, a lot of things not going right. And they were very positive and obviously it, it made them and us all stronger together. Um, but yeah, I guess where where would you like me to start with that? Just kind of from the beginning. Well, you were probably feeling sick, I would imagine, and you went to the doctor and so forth. How did that whole tra whole gotcha. thing transpire? So actually, my dad was coaching at Columbine, and they were playing in a tournament in Omaha, Nebraska, while the College World Series was going on. Um, and we went. So beforehand, I was playing little league baseball, and I was getting serious pain in my knees. And it was really weird. And like, I would try to run down the line to first and my, like my legs just wouldn't cycle. And my, wow. I was just like, what is going on here? And so they thought like, maybe I had an issue with my knees or some or growing pains or something like that. Then we go to Omaha and I just start feeling super sick. I didn't want to do anything. I was kind of running a fever. I just wanted to sleep. The only time I felt good was when I was in the pool. <laughs> And I think it was just because like the water was cold and it felt good. Um, but we went to like a, I think it was the year that Fresno State won the College World Series. And we went okay. to like the Georgia Fresno State game. And I pretty much slept through the whole game because I just felt so cruddy. Um, and so after that, we were driving home from Omaha and the drive was kind of brutal and I wasn't feeling good. We got out of the car as soon as we pulled up to our house and I got sick um, and we were thinking maybe I was just really dehydrated and maybe needed to just go get some fluids or something. So we went to the ER and they ran some tests, took my blood and they found out like something is seriously wrong. So they tossed me in an ambulance, drove me down to the nearest hospital. Um, and I got a, just a bunch of CAT scans, MRIs. I can't really remember everything they did, but I also had bruises all over my body and they were like, at first they were like, Hey, like, are, are you and your parents? Okay. Something like that. And we were like, yes, obviously like, I'm like, there's no problem with my parents. And my parents were like, yes, like we're, there's no issue there. And what happened was my white blood cell count was so incredibly low that, I mean, you could just tap me on the arm and there was nothing to like fight back. And so it just created bruises. Um, wow. And so the white blood cell count, I'm not going to get this right, but it's supposed to be in like the thousands or something like that. And mine was in like 60 to 80 or something wow. like that. Wow. Um, 
Yeah. And so they're doing more tests. I think it took a day or two. Um, and my liver was not in good state. My kidneys were not in good states. Um, and so they ultimately figured out what I had. Um, it was stage four Burkitt's lymphoma. Um, and that's just a cancer that's within your lymphatic system. So fortunately, I didn't have any tumors. I didn't have to do any radiation, which super grateful for that. Um, but because it was in stage four, um, it was pretty deep into yeah, it. So they yeah. were definitely worried. Um, and my parents tell me this story all the time. I don't remember it. And I think it's just because I was probably not doing so hot at the time. But essentially what happened is the doctors came in to talk to me. And Dr. Zimbelman was my oncologist. And she was the one who basically ran my whole treatment. And she is the one of the greatest human beings in the world. That's awesome. Um, That's so and awesome. yeah, we go back and see her every time I do my checkups. And every time I see her, it's just like, she's just always so grateful to see me and any of her other patients that um, she brought back and she that's a story for another time but I'm very grateful for that woman I know my family is too um, but anyways they came in and basically told me hey um, you can either do a very aggressive type of chemotherapy and it'll take seven to nine months for you to be completely cleared, assuming it all works. Um, but it'll be really aggressive. You'll be really sick and it won't be too much fun. Um, or you can do kind of the lighter version. They called it the, the kids version. So the, the harsher one was the adult version that yeah. they told me. And the lighter one was the kid version. Um, and so they're like, you can do the kid version. It'll take like a year and a half, two years, but it'll be a lot lighter dosages at a time. Um, you probably won't feel as crappy. And I just wanted to be done as soon as I yeah. could. So I was like, bring it on. Let's do the adult wow. one. Like, let's get this over with as quick as possible. Cause I was just miserable and yeah. I didn't feel like it could really get any worse. And I just wanted it to be done. So we went with that. Um, and essentially it was um, a week after a few months, I think a few months I was just in the hospital getting treatment and then it would just be a week on and then two weeks off, a week on of chemo, two weeks off, a week on, two weeks off, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, throughout those times they would do, uh, they would go and check out my bone marrow and do spinal taps um, oh. every few months just to, you know, see how much was still in my body and stuff like that. Um, and those are real and, painful, aren't they, Tommy, those spinal taps? Yeah, they're not great, um, yeah. but but I think I just had a lot, so much other things on my mind. Because um, when you're sick like that, it gives you something else to focus on. So I'm yeah. sure, like my stomach didn't feel good or whatever. I just felt tired. That all I would do was lay in bed. So if you get a spinal tap, like yeah, it doesn't feel great. But if you're not walking around or doing anything, it's not. not it's bad. probably not the worst thing in the world. Um, yeah, so that's essentially kind of how all that went. And God, um, I responded really well to the chemotherapy. Um, I don't think it looked, the outlook was great, like right when they figured out what was, what was wrong with me, just because it was at stage four um, and my liver and kidneys were not doing good. Um, but I mean, obviously today I've made a full recovery, enough so to even be in the Air Force Academy and get a waiver to go there. So um, and the type I had, it's extremely aggressive and it always happens within, it's very rare and it happens within kids who are about ages seven to nine and usually young boys. So they don't really know what the cause of it is. It happens to extremely healthy kids. So they wonder if maybe it's like from turf or something like that from kids who play sports. Um, but the type I had when it comes back it comes back within five to ten years and I'm about 13 or 14 I stopped counting after 10 years oh, good um, <laughs> but I'm kind of I'm kind of in the clear now and um, haven't had any issues since and it's honestly one of the biggest blessings in, blessings in disguise I mean I am who I am largely today because of that and I look at things the way I look at them because of that and um Sure, it sucked. it sucked at the time, but it definitely gave me a lot. So I'm very grateful for that. Have, have you been able to use that experience in helping others or serving others in some way? 
Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, and I like that that's the way that you think about that. Um, I would say like during basic training um, or any team I've been a part of, um, and maybe I don't look at it as directly how I'm being able to serve others, but just giving my, sharing my perspective yes. um, when things are going wrong or something's really bad. Um, I definitely don't want to be the person that's like, oh, it could be way worse yeah, and just yeah. be that annoying voice. But I do feel like I can contribute, like knowing in the back of my head that things really could be a little bit worse um, and that we should be like super thankful to be where we're at today. Um, I think I do provide maybe a sense of calmness and just like, hey, you know, things are not going great right now, like in basic training. Hey, this is tough. But like in order to make it to the end, we can't think about the end right now. Like, let's just get little W's at a time and make it to the next meal and let's make it to lunch. And after we eat lunch, let's make it to dinner and then let's make it to breakfast. And I think something like that um, is something that I bring to the table and bring to other people to kind of maybe help get through things. Um, but I'm kind of glad you asked that question because I've maybe looked at it not so selflessly in terms of what exactly can I do for other people um, using my experience. I think I've just organically done it a little yeah, bit, but yeah. not, I haven't really reflected on it and, and noticed what I've done. So I think I'm glad you asked me that. Um, I can kind of pursue that a little bit more now. Well, that's what we're doing. And, and you're, you've always amazed me. And I'll just give a little bit of background. I, you know, I really got to meet Tommy. I was very fortunate that I coached a team in the summer that we take some of the best juniors in Colorado and go out and play in a tournament called the Sunbelt Tournament out in Oklahoma. And Tommy was on our team. And that's really where I really got to really get to know you at a different level. And that was um, my blessing that I got to meet you because I see a different person and a, and a person that is just amazing to me in terms of your outlook on life, how you are as a leader, um, how you go about your daily routine and so forth is, is pretty amazing to me for your age at that time. You were 17, 18 years old at that time. But let's go through your journey as an athlete, Tommy. What, what, you know, it's, as an athlete, how has that helped you in terms of being at the United States Air Force Academy, which isn't an easy place to be at in terms of school and being in the military and being an athlete at the same time and doing all those things, um, waking up at six in the morning or five in the morning every day and, and having that routine. How's an athlete from being a football player and a basketball player and a baseball player and all that kind of transpired into helping you get through some of that kind of stuff? Yeah, um, I think first from like the most basic and physical and like skills level, playing soccer, like growing up throughout, yeah you know, up until high school made me a way better athlete at basketball, football, baseball. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of just football and baseball in high school, um, that's, I mean, that's where you get your very first experiences on one, how to follow when you're a freshman and a sophomore, and then two, how to lead when you're a junior and a senior. Um, and like all of us kids when we go into high school are highly malleable and you can like we want people to follow and we want to learn and figure out how we're going to do life and play sports and um and then when you're a junior and a senior like you get that opportunity to take in kids and try to teach them the right ways and you use your experiences whether it's friday night on the field in football or it's during practice or it's the times you get with your your boys outside of practice and games where you really develop those relationships and high school is super cool because you get to play multiple sports with your best friends. Yeah. And like, you guys all have this goal um, to do it in one sport or another or both. And like that brings people together in a way that you just don't get much um, mm -hmm. outside of life. Um, and being an athlete and getting to keep, pursuing those same visions and missions when you move on to college and the next level um it all starts in high school and even before that when you're on teams and that's the same thing that's kind of inspiring me to move on to the next thing in the air force because i want to continue to be on a team and have these these same 
relationships with people around me that I trust and I can count on um, and that are like-minded. And so I guess the, the long roundabout answer to your question is um, being an athlete has given me like a ton of perspectives. It's taught me how to fall. It's taught me how to lead. And it's given me a ton of really good relationships with people my age that I'm teammates with or coaches that I've had like yourself that I look up to and that I loved playing for, even though it was just a week down in Oklahoma. It was an awesome um, week. <laughs> it was an awesome week. And it's just, it's cool to look back and think of all the relationships I have from it. Um, and it all started just because I got to play sports. I was fortunate enough to have a family that could let me play all the sports that I wanted to. And um, it allowed me to go to college and keep playing and then end up at the United States Air Force Academy where after I'm done with baseball, after this next weekend, um, I get to start pursuing a different passion. And it's weird to think about because baseball has always been like, the number one thing in my life. Um, but it's cool that I have something else that I'm passionate about that I want to pursue. So I'm very grateful for that. And we'll, we'll get into that here in a second. It's um, going back to a little bit in high school. This is real quick. You play for a legendary football coach in high school too. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, coach Andy Lowry. It's amazing. Awesome coach. Yeah. It's, it's really amazing. Um, when you leave, high school and you just go out into the world and you see more and more coaching just through playing summer ball and helping out with other coaches and everything like that. I was so fortunate to have the coaches that I did in high school. My dad, um, Coach legends. Lowry. Yep. Yeah. Um, coach Thiel King at the, at Columbine uh, basketball coach. Um, I haven't spoken to him in a while, but I played basketball my freshman and sophomore year. And he is another unreal human being, an unreal coach. And getting to play for you in the summer, um, Coach Holzmer for Slammers. You know, I just got really lucky and had a lot of really good coaches. Um, and, yeah, Coach Lowry is, I mean, not even Coach, like not only Coach Lowry, but Coach Tonelli, Coach Moore, Coach Thomas. I mean, I'm sure I'm forgetting someone. Just an unreal staff at Columbine. And, man, I learned a lot about, about learning and about, you know, how to, how to coach and how to motivate people and how to be a, a part of a great team. They do a really great job there and they don't ever give up. And um, I'm just super fortunate to have gone through coaches in all sports like that, where, you know, I'm led the right way and they push us to the limit and they want the best from us. And yeah, I've definitely taken a lot from from all those coaches that I've been around. And, and your principal, Frank DeAngelis, amazing, and amazing Mr. human D. being right there. And Mr. D, yep. Just, Unbelievable person. Yep, and then even Dr. Summers after him, and then um, Mr. Christie after that, just a lot of really good people. And what's, what's neat and what I want people to understand is how much you have taken in and you're like a sponge from all these different people. You you appreciate what you've gotten from these people and you've used what they've given you in, in service of others and helping others. And that's what I want people to get from this. And let's go through your journey in baseball, Tommy, you know, when you graduated from Columbine, let's go a little bit through that journey to get to the air force. What happened there? Yeah. So graduated high school, um, was committed to Texas A&M, uh, went there, played my first year there, didn't play much. Um, probably played in like 17 or 18 games was kind of like a defensive replacement um, or would go in and run bags um, and awesome experience. Awesome dudes just wasn't the right fit for me. Um, I wanted to, I just wanted to play and I didn't know how many opportunities I was going to get there. I was playing with a lot of really good players um, and I wanted to develop. And so um I started looking around after my year at a and and found Midland Junior College and, you know, talking to a bunch of people who went and played junior college, um, saying how awesome it was and whatnot. Um, I got in touch with uh, Coach Coleman, who his, uh, his son was actually one of my teammates at a and at the time, but his dad was um, the coach at Midland. And so I ended up committing to Midland. And, you know, a couple of weeks after he... Um, he ended up 
uh, leaving so he could go watch because his other son was going to go to AM too. And he wanted to be able to watch them through college, which I totally understand yeah. that. Yeah. So um, Coach Rodriguez was was a pitching coach, became the head coach at Midland and another phenomenal head coach and leader that I got to be under. Um, Midland was honestly one of the best years of my life. That team was full of a bunch of guys who were great baseball players, gritty baseball players, um, and just great people. Like we played hard. We, we played fast. We had, um, we just had a, like as a whole team, we just were super passionate about the game. And that's, what's so cool about junior college. Like it's a lot of guys who maybe didn't get the opportunity to go division one right out of high school, weren't good enough, didn't have the grades, but they loved baseball and loved it so much so that they wanted to go to a junior college to keep that opportunity out there to go play at a higher level. And I met some of my best friends at Midland Junior College. We all lived in one hallway um, in this one just <laughs> dorm. And it was just uh, it was just really cool living with a bunch of guys. We played, we played together. We practiced together. We did everything together. We had this little uh, garage next to our field. And you just like slide up the garage door and it's the grittiest gym ever. And we worked out there and it was awesome. I wouldn't trade that experience for the world. Um, and while I was at Midland, I, um, I had no clue where I wanted to go next. Um, I had a good year and I started getting recruited again. And um, I didn't know if I wanted to try to go to another big school or if I wanted to try to go to a smaller school or what. Um, and Coach Kaz out of the Air Force Academy, he was recruiting me in high school, um, him and Coach Picknell. And I just didn't have any urge to be in the military. Um, I thought it was cool, but I just, I just didn't want to do it at the time. But I think gaining some perspective, being at a giant university like a and and then going to Midland um, and then having my brother be at the Air Force Academy, who's like, hey, reach out to these guys and see what see what they think. Pick their brain. He's like, dude, I'd love to. I think it'd be awesome if I could coach you, like kind of bring everything full circle. But at the same time, like you make your decision. And so I talked to a bunch of guys who were on the team then and outstanding human beings, people that I felt like I kind of aligned with yeah. and that I wanted to be like. And it was another opportunity to keep playing baseball. And so, um, you know, now I'm at the academy for different reasons than I was when I first wanted to go there. Um, I thought the idea of serving your country and being a true servant was awesome, but I didn't fully like embrace that. Cause like I, you can say that as much as you want, but until you get there and you go through it and you feel like you're actually making some sort of an impact, you can't say that and hundred percent believe it. Um, and now I can more so like when people say, when people say, Hey, where are you going? And I'm like the air force Academy. They're like, Oh, thank you for your service. It's kind of like, well, I haven't done anything yet, but Thank you for that. And I hope I can make you proud and be someone that like deserves that. So, um, yeah, it's kind of been a, a real whirlwind and I've been everywhere, but I'm glad I got the perspectives and got to go to a big school at junior college before being at the academy. So I was never wondering, you know, what I was missing out on or anything like that. Um, and I've met incredible people at the academy and it's definitely challenged me. Um, but I'm grateful for it. And I'm grateful for where I'm at now. So, so what, what's a day like for you at the air force Academy, a, a typical day. So people yeah. can really understand the sacrifice that you guys go through to serve, to serve us, to serve our country. So um, it's changed year by year since I've been there. Um, sometimes we'll have, we used to have like these duties in the morning before school and everything. Um, once COVID hit and it kind of changed a little bit and things got a little bit different, um, it changed, but I'll kind of give you the rundown of, you know, what it was like the last few months. Um, in season uh, for baseball, um, a Monday, or I'll say a Tuesday, because our Mondays are off day after a weekend. A Tuesday, we'd wake up, we'd have classes from seven to noon. Um, and then after lunch, we'll have, um, it's called an M5, which is just that that designation of that period. But it's basically a time for our upper leadership, our permanent party to do as they wish with that time. So they can give us a lesson on something or have us do something for the squadron or the options are endless. Um, but it's another time to, to use to develop us. And then 
for us as athletes, we'll have practice from around one or one thirty, and then we have our four. I think it's a four hour window, um, and we'll end at two thirty, three thirty, four thirty, five thirty ish, and then we'll have our lift. Um, and then after that is when it gets interesting because we'll go and eat dinner. And as long as we don't have any requirements left for that day, which some days we will, it just totally depends on the schedule. Then we'll be busting our butts with homework um, and trying to finish everything up, get everything done for classes and prepare for the next day of classes um, up until around you know 10 or 11, whenever your designated time to go to bed is. For me, um, school kicks my butt and it always kicked my butt, but at the academy, it really kicks my butt. Um, and I don't ever really have time to finish everything. And so I just tell myself, hey, once 1030 hits, as long as I don't have like a giant project due the next day, whatever I don't have done yet, I'm just going to sleep and I'll wear it a little bit because that's the whole point of the academy is to give you way more than you can handle. And then on top of that, if you're an athlete, that's a four, five, six hour block of every single day where you're practicing lifting, um, mobility, whatever it might be. Um, and it takes a lot of time. So, um, and like, not only that, but if you have, you know, some books that you want to read on your personal time and stuff like that, you kind of got to chop that out. And I think that's important to do just for your own mental health, um, is doing things that you personally want to do yourself. So yeah, sometimes I won't finish every single problem on our mechanical engineering problem set or whatever. Um, but I'll get my sleep that I need and I'll be able to do the things I need to do to keep being successful there. So. And keep progressing. It's about a normal day. Yeah. Keep progressing. And, and keep so progressing. now That's this right. is your last three games as a baseball player coming up this weekend. What is that feeling like? Um, it's really weird. Somebody asked me that, you know, two days ago, they're like, Hey man, you got three games left. Like, what's that feel like? And I don't have an answer. Um, all I know is that, and Kaz talks about this all the time. Um, you never want to look like when people look back at who you were at the Academy, they're not going to look back at what your batting average was or how many home runs yeah, you hit. Yeah. They're just going to look back at the person that you are. Yeah. Um, and coach Kaz's motto is taking in, you know, young boys and turn them into men and great husbands and great fathers and great leaders. And that's his overall goal with us um, as not even just the baseball players, but anyone who seeks Kaz or anyone Kaz seeks out to try and help at the academy. Um, he's a mentor to hundreds of people. Um, and I guess he always, he always talks about, you know, when you look at yourself after you're done playing, like, are you going to be proud of what you did? And there's one thing I can control every single time I've played and it's just playing hard. It's getting on the field, right. It's getting off the field, right. That's something my dad taught me at an early age. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, whether it's, I, I don't even care if it looks dumb or doesn't or whatever. It's something that I have always been able to control. You know, after this last weekend, you were at our games, I was up, the bases were loaded. It was a 16, 13 game. So it was a football game, but it was an opportunity for me to tie the game. If I just like put a ball in the gap, found a barrel and I rolled over to first end of the inning. <laughs> and it was extremely frustrating because it was a time to pick our team up and like put us in the game. And I didn't come through. And like, at that point, like you have all the rage and frustration of, of not coming through for your team. Um, but there's one thing I could control and it was, taking my helmet off, not slamming it or doing anything, taking my batting gloves off, giving it to my coach, grab my stuff and sprint my butt onto the field. And um, that's the one thing I'll worry about this weekend is making sure I'm the, the best leader I can be for our team. And I'm worrying about what I can control and that's my attitude and how hard I play. Um, and as long as I do that, I'll look back at my whole time at the Academy and be happy with it. Um, I might not have, done all the things I wanted to do in terms of numbers and whatnot, but I'd like to think I've made an impact on the team and, you know, at the Academy. And so, um, and that's just doing the things that I can control. And so I'll be, I'll be appreciative of that. Man, that's powerful. I have, I have goosebumps on my arms right now from what you just said. Um, 
because the game does give you so much more than numbers. It gives you, you, you mentioned it earlier, it gives you relationships that to me, that's the number one thing it gives us. You and I wouldn't be talking here right now if it wasn't for the game exactly. of baseball. Exactly. You know, uh, Coach Kaz is amazing. Um, I, he, I don't know if you know this, but I had him on two times on my podcast uh, two or three weeks ago. He's been on twice. I had, he was on first, and then I, it was so good, I had to have him on for a second time to finish. He's an amazing man. I, I hope everyone gets to listen to his, his podcast that I did with him. And, you know, there, there's so many things that can go through your mind, you know, when playing a game of baseball, it gives you so much. It, I, I call it the game of opportunity. You know, a lot of people call it the game of failure. And because a, a person in the major leagues can go three for 10 and be a multi multi-millionaire and they failed seven times. So people call it the game of failure. I, I don't call it that those seven times that you didn't, you didn't succeed the way you wanted to is always an opportunity to get better and get stronger from it. And that's what you, that's what you just said. That's what you just did. And, and what you're giving to your teammates on a daily basis is what's more important than the numbers that you put up. And, you know, it's a, it's a powerful thing, what you just, what you just went through. And I hope people can understand that not only in athletics, but in the business world as well. And in their, in their daily lives as well as what you're going through. And what's your next journey, Tommy? You know, I know when you graduate from your, you still have one more year of school at the Air Force Academy, you're going to be coaching there next year with Kaz and so forth. But what, are, what is your goal? What are you trying to do? Because I think this is really cool. And before you get into that, before I forget, I want you to tell us about the number that you're wearing at Air Force and the significance of that number, because I think it's a, it's a, this is a really um, powerful story as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So number 20 um, was Travis Wilkie's number. Um, and Travis Wilkie um, was a catcher at the Academy and he graduated in um, graduated in 17 or 18. Um, I wasn't there when he was at the Academy, but my brother coached him. Um, he's like a son to Kaz. He's like a son to my brother. Um, and he was on a training mission flying T-38s, which is like the, uh, the trainer fighter jet and, um, him and another baseball guy were actually flying this training mission together. And, um, uh, a couple of things went wrong when they went to land. And Travis's jet flipped um, and him and his backseater officer that was in the back, um, they were killed instantly on impact. And um, so Travis made a huge impact on the baseball team, um, on the Air Force Academy. And um, basically what happened was um, his, his wife, Peyton Wilkie, um, she's been doing absolutely every, she's a s extremely strong woman and she has been doing um a bunch of things to just preserve travis's memory and keep his name alive and um one of the things that was come up with between i don't know if it was with her and kaz or or what but it was to wear um to elect somebody to wear travis's number every single year which is number 20 um and our camo jerseys have number or have the name and last name or the number and last name on our backs. And so whoever's wearing Travis's uh, number, when they were 20, they'll wear his, they'll wear Wilkie across the, across their back. And um, basically it's just, um, we have, we have the team vote um, on, you know, someone to represent Travis for that year and somebody who represents what Travis represented. And um, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to, um, wear number 20 this year and be voted on to wear that by my teammates. And that was one of the coolest things ever. Um, I remember when Kaz told me I broke down into tears. I mean, I don't even, yeah. I don't even know Travis personally, but I know the impact he made and to just like, I remember thinking like, I'm going to wear Travis's number, but I don't know if I do anything like he did, or if I represent, you know, the team or, whatever the way he did and as I was like having these doubts and thoughts I was just thinking Travis is probably up there looking down like hey Tommy shut up wear my number proud and like do it right and you know from that point on I was like okay I'm gonna wear this number there's no other thing I would rather play my senior year for and whether I've had a great year or a terrible year it doesn't matter I mean 
I'm getting to do something that not everyone gets to do. I'm getting to represent an incredible human being. And I just hope I represented and wore his number half as good as he did. And it's been a really cool opportunity. It's one of the things I'm definitely most proud of. And um, it's just, it's a, it's a real humble and special opportunity. So it's been really cool. Uh, you did it again. I got goosebumps again. Um, <laughs> I, I, you kind of got me in tears here a little bit too. Um, it's amazing uh, that you get to represent him. And that's what people don't understand about the players at the Air Force Academy. And I've talked to Kaz about this a lot. It's, you know, he's not only preparing you guys for a baseball game, he's preparing you guys to possibly fight in war for our country someday. And that, that's, you know, it's a, it's a lot different than a lot of places that people coach at and so forth. And, and what you guys go through on a daily basis in, in training for us is in serving us is amazing to me. Uh, it, uh, your next your next chapter though Tommy you you want to serve even more with what you want to do in special in is it special ops or tag is, is that the is that the term can you explain so, that a little bit yeah so um first off like I just want to preface it with um it's something that like I have to go get picked up and like make it through a lot of these things to be able to get picked up for it so not a done deal more um, hurdles Yes, more, more hurdles. Exactly. Exactly what I want. Um, but I just don't want to, I don't want to put out anything that like, it's something I'm for sure going right. to, I'm in already earn. because yeah. you got to earn that. And yeah. I have buddies who have earned it, um, who are currently in the pipeline, um, and buddies at, at the Academy who are my age, who went to selection and have gotten picked up and who are going to go into that career field. But I haven't done that yet. Um, I got the opportunity to go and I was about to go through selection and I got quarantined um, yeah. with COVID. So I didn't get to go. Um, Another hurdle. And then, yep. And then the baseball season started. So um, just haven't got that opportunity yet. And now I'm just waiting for the next um, assessment and selection, which is what it's called to, to go through so I can go and try and get picked up. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's special operations within the Air Force. You know, Army has their special operations. Navy has theirs. Air Force has theirs. Um, and yeah, it was something I trained for all last fall. Um, I had three buddies that I trained with. And this is another thing that I'm just super thankful to have Coach Kaz and the teammates that I did. I had to miss a lot of lifts and practice because I was training in the water or running or doing something to train for selection um, to try to get picked up. And it was very frustrating when, you know, put in three or four months of training and was at the peak of my physical condition, you know, cause you do these training yeah. cycles and you keep peaking and then going down and keep peaking. And so I was right where I wanted to be. And I got down to Hurlburt, Florida, which is where uh, special operations for the air force is. Um, and getting quarantined was super tough. Cause that was a big, that was a big thing coming. Um, but life happens. Um, it's not going to stop you. Yep. It's not going to stop me. I'll have an opportunity, whether it's this summer or right after I commission next year, um, I'll have an opportunity to go do it. And exactly. It's just a, it's just another hurdle. The obstacle is the way, I mean, I was kind of getting that from you when you were saying, you know, baseball is a game, not a failure necessarily, but opportunity. Um, and so it's just more time to train, more time to prepare. And, you know, we have all these things, all these resources open to us at the Academy and I'd be a fool to not use them because if I'm going, if I'm trying to go into something as significant as special operations within the air force, I'm going to be um, in charge of not in charge, but it's going to be up to me when some decisions need to be made. And I'm going to want to make sure I'm as prepared as possible to make those decisions when lives are on the line. Um, and I definitely don't want to just breeze by the academy and not take everything in that needs to be taken in in order to be the best officer you can be. Because that's the crazy thing about the military is when, you know, us kids who go to a service academy graduate, we become officers, second lieutenants for the Air Force um, when you graduate and you outrank um, any enlisted member. And those are some people who have had 15 years of service. And that's crazy to think that you could outrank them. And 
you definitely should not go into any situation um, thinking you know more than them because you just don't. You haven't no. had the experience. You haven't, you haven't been across seas fighting wars for our country. You haven't gained any of that. And so um, I want to be as prepared and use all the resources possible to be the best officer I can be. So when I am in charge of, you know, other airmen and enlisted guys and people that I outrank that I am as competent as I can be. Um, and I know they're going to know more than me and I'm going to rely on them heavily, but, um, that's definitely something that I think about and that I don't want to, I don't want to breeze by the Academy and not be a capable leader when I get out. That's powerful, powerful advice for anybody that wants to be in leadership roles in terms of business or sports, military or whatever. I, I hope people can really, really listen to that, that last two or three minutes of what, how you explain that, because that's a humbleness and a vulnerability that leaders need to have. And I think those are two qualities that leaders have, great leaders have, exceptional leaders have, is vulnerability in humbleness. And I think that you just showed that and uh, that's powerful, really powerful. Let's go into a little real quick. I know we're running out of time here. Tell, tell me about the influence that your brother CJ has on you. I, it, he's, he's such an awesome guy. He was a coach at the Academy now coaches in the Cincinnati Reds organization, but he's such a, a positive, um, just outgoing person. I, I love being around. Everyone loves being around CJ. Just give us a little bit about him. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've looked up to him since I was a little annoying little brother. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we were very similar in some ways, but we are extremely different in other ways. Um, he has been somebody I've really looked up to and someone I aspire to be like, yeah. obviously. Um, and it's kind of crazy. I've had these conversations with him, my parents, um, because like, when you have an older brother that's very successful and people, other people look up to and want to be like, and want to know and want to, you know, take information in from, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty hard not to want to be like him, yeah. you know? Um, but at the same time, like I'm, I'm, I am my own person and I want to do my own things. And, you know, I think that's what makes the dynamic so cool is the things that matter for us to be like, like our values and what we believe in, um, those things line up, but then other ways, how we speak, how we think, how we go about things is a little bit different. And I think that makes us gel pretty well. Um, yeah. and I know I've learned a ton from my brother and he'll always be my older brother, um, that I'm kind of looking up to, but he's taught me a lot about baseball, how to play. He's taught me a lot about being a human being and how to speak speak and how to communicate and listen um, because he's someone who has just kind of learned as he's grown up, you know, how to communicate and how to, I mean, when you have to, when you're a college hitting coach or now a professional hitting coach, like you need to be able to think of complex thoughts and ideas and then convey them differently to each guy that you're trying to teach to. And like, that's something I've learned from just watching him and listening to him on other podcasts and whatnot, but he's really good at that. And that's what makes him really good at his job. And he's very witty and very smart. And just like you said, fun to be around, fun to talk to. And um, I've learned a lot from him from that. And communicating is like, it's such a important skill to have that I'm definitely still learning, but I've learned a lot from my brother with that. Um, and then just Obviously, you know, we've learned this from our parents, hard work, um, mm, yeah. just trying to be people of high integrity and trying to, I mean, my mom preaches that all the freaking time. And I mean, that's the, those same things that make you, that allow you to trust people and feel comfortable with people is when you know you can trust them and that you believe in them. Um, and I see all those values in my dad, my mom, my brother, my sister. And um, yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Long, long answers to short questions, but no, no, oh, those are, that's, it. that's what we're doing this for. Cause your sister's a servant too, right? She's a nurse yes, or something, she is. isn't she? Or yep. Yep. Yeah. She's a nurse. Yeah. yeah. So your whole family just serves people, you know, and you, and you think about that and that, that's very powerful. And that's, you know, to me, that's, that's what I want to try to do now. Uh, Tommy is, is help people find their gifts and use those gifts to serve others. And when you look at your family, that's exactly what your family does, right? Because I know CJ really well, and that's exactly what he does. He's got so many gifts 
not just, just coaching baseball, but making people's lives better when he coaches baseball. That's what I think separates your brother. And I haven't got to meet your sister, but I know she serves by being a nurse, you know, and I know your mom and dad and who they are. And, and that's what's exactly what you're doing too. And, and, and what's going to happen is, is that's going to transpire into the people that you lead someday too. And that's, what's cool about it. So now I got to ask three questions and we'll be done. What's your, uh, you know, my, to go along with my book, the finding your, finding your purpose, perspective, and passion. What's your, what's your purpose in life? Would you say that right now? So, um, that's a question that I think I've thought about a lot and I never actually just like had one answer that I always stuck to. Um, but now as I'm finishing up like playing baseball and I'm trying to get into a new career field and I'm in the air force. Um, I really do believe, and I think this is what's drawn me to the career field that I want to get into, but whether it's directly or indirectly, um, I want to, I want to be somebody who uses what I have and uses the gifts that I've been given to go save lives. Um, I feel like that sounds wow. very cheesy coming out. No, it's just powerful. From, well, and it's, it's something that like, until I figured out the career fields here at the Academy that give me that opportunity. And it's something that I feel like I am, that I'm good at outside of sports. Um, like just in terms of pushing yourself and liking those challenges and wanting to go be in difficult situations to go help people and save people. Um, that's what the crow and stow. That's what I want to go do. I want to, I want to go become a special tactics officer. Um, and whether it's directly or indirectly, um, they save lives and they, they do things for our military that, um, that can't be done by most people. And I really feel like I can use kind of all my experiences in my life and what I've been given to go be effective in that career field. And, you know, obviously I'm not in it yet, but if there's something you want to go do, you got to believe that, that you're made for it and that you should, that you should be in it and that, you know, you got to be confident. And I am confident that, that this is a career that I want to go pursue. Um, and so, you know, it's a purpose that I think I found a little bit late, but I found it. Um, and I really, I really believe that's something that I'm going to get to go do. And so, you know, I'm going to keep jumping over these hurdles and I'm going to keep trying to put myself in that position to go serve that purpose. And, um, if, if it turns out that's not it, it's okay. I'll go find something else. But I do believe um, very strongly that it's something I'm going to get to go do. So I just got to keep rolling with the punches and um, get in that, give myself the best opportunity to, to get into that career field. So we'll uh, see what happens. Again, powerful. You know, I, I have a saying, I probably say it on every podcast that I do, that people say that life's a, a marathon. I don't think life's a marathon. I think life is a steeplechase. I don't know in track. I'm not a big track person, but in track, steeplechase is a is a long distance race with hurdles and jumps and stuff that you there go mud through. Too. Yeah, there's yeah, like I you feel jump like over I'm in the mud right now. <laughs> yeah, you jump into the water and you do all this kind of stuff, and um, you know that's that's kind of what you just described, and and that's kind of what your life has been through the cancer and through you know, going to a couple different colleges and finding the right spot for you and, and all those different things. And you've proven to yourself that you can get over the hurdles, especially with, the, you know, with the cancer, how many nine-year-olds can go through what you went through and, and so forth. And, and, and that's what you're going to be able to convey to other people. And, and guys, it's so powerful. Now let's, you've kind of talked a little bit about this. You've brought up the word, what's your perspective in life? Yeah. Um, my perspective is just, some people don't like hearing this, but it always has been my bread and butter. I mean, it just can always be worse. Um, no. And I don't mean to like say a negative thing for a positive thing, but it helps me at least the way I think about it is just being super appreciative for what I have. And, you know, you said it earlier, the opportunities that come out of life from failures, I think that is my perspective is is like so much of it revolves around that like things earlier in my life kind of showed me that really tough things in life are 
enormous opportunities to use for the rest of your life to impact others around you, to impact yourself, to impact your family. Um, and so my perspective, and I try to share it on as much people as I can, um, directly or indirectly, is just that, you know, bad things that happen aren't necessarily bad. Um, like you can get a lot of good from it. And so you just shouldn't ever give up. Like just because something bad happens doesn't mean that that's the end. Like it could be the start of something really good. Um, and I keep saying the obstacle is the way is because there's a book um, titled The Obstacle is the Way. And it's kind of a stoic way of thinking, but um, I can't think of the author right now off the top of my head, but um, I just love that train of thought. And, you know, getting a little philosophical, but Marcus Aurelius and, you know, guys who were big stoic influences have all these writings and we have the opportunity to go look at it and read it and learn from it yeah. and um, progress and progress. Exactly. So um, I just think, I think that's my perspective. I think it's, you can use bad for good um, and you can use hurdles and issues and problems for, for good. You just got to find it. You just got to find why that obstacle was placed there and what you can use it for. It's <laughs> you're blowing this up, man. How about your passion? What's your passion? Um, my passion is, I mean, it was baseball forever. Yeah. Um, yeah. and now it's, it's getting into a career field where I can be extremely content and believe in what I'm doing is impacting those around me. Um, if it is saving lives or if it's giving the people around me the opportunity to go save lives and using their talents to do so, um, that's my passion, just being filled in rooms with people who are like-minded, who yeah. want to work their tail off, but care more about the people around them than themselves. Um, I mean, I think that's why I'm so drawn to that career field is you're with a team. You guys have all these, these core values that really align. Um, you have to have extremely high integrity. You have to just want to always work your tail off and want challenges and want things that make you better. And that's what makes me enjoy life. I mean, life would be super boring if there weren't those challenges and weren't these hard things that you had to go do. Um, and it's just way more rewarding when it's like that. And I, I'm passionate about being in a career field with people sur who surround me that are like-minded in that way. You know, I don't, you don't ever want to group think, but you want people who have these same values, who want to go, you know, make an impact, serve our country, save people's lives and make this place a safer place to be for us. So um, that's my passion. And um, I'm really passionate about pursuing that passion. Yeah, you're, you're an amazing kid. I, I don't know. I guess we don't call you a kid anymore. I still look at you as a kid, but uh, this has been a, a really powerful hour. I don't know if you know, we've already gone an hour. I could, I could keep going for longer and longer with you. Maybe we'll try to have you on again if we can, but you know, just yeah, best of luck to. to you in your future. Uh, best of luck to your last three games this weekend. I know it's going to be special for you. I want you to take everything in um, and just enjoy and, and reflect. I want you to take some time to reflect back over the years that you played and all the people and your dad and your brother and all the people you played with and, and just reflect on the relationships that you that you still have and will always have from it. And and just enjoy that because you deserve that. You deserve to have that time of the reflection of, of great memories. And, and those memories, again, those will never be taken away. And then the legacy that you're leaving Air Force, you know, the, the players on the team, and you're going to get to be able to continue that with your coaching and so forth. And, you know, and you, you talk about communication. I, one thing I want, to, I want to leave you with is always remember this, learn to listen so you can listen to learn because you're always going to be learning from people all the way through your life. And I want you to always remember that it's always better for leaders to learn to listen. So you can listen to learn about people and what they're doing and how they're doing it. You know, you talked a little bit about your brother and how he can adapt to different people. It's because he's a good listener. And, um, and I know you are too, and you're, you're, you're going to be a leader of our country. You already are. And I thank you for your service. And I know you're humble about that, but I, I truly do. And I, I think all the listeners think the same thing. Thank you for your service, Tommy. And, and 
the inspiration that you're giving everybody through this podcast and your everyday walk in life is, is amazing to me. And I'm just very fortunate to have you in my life. And I appreciate you coming on and doing this for us and, and uh, best of luck with everything. And I'm always here for you if you ever need anything. Coach, I appreciate that more than you know. Um, and I'm just extremely fortunate that that I got this opportunity that you it's amazing, you know, wanted to have me on here. And so thank you so much for that. Um, I'm just really thankful for it. Um, and thank you for having me on and being somebody who's trying to make an impact in a bunch of people's lives around you. Um, and maybe not even knowing which people you, you make so. an impact on. That truly is, um, that truly is real servantship. And, um, it's just, it's really cool to see that. And it's, it's good to know that there's, there's people out there that want to do that. Um, so thank you for everything. Thanks, Tommy. And have a great weekend. Okay, buddy. Yes, sir. You too. I'll, um, I'll take this last weekend in the right way. All right. Thank you for listening to another edition of the People Progressing Podcast with Tommy Gilman. Man, that was just a powerful day, powerful hour with Tommy. Um, and he's going to be doing some more great things in his life. And I just appreciate you all listening and supporting. Now, if you could get on and subscribe to the podcast, write any kind of reviews or comments, it would be great um, if you could do that. Also, if you need any help or if you need me to come speak to your group, I would love to do that. You can get a hold of me at coachjoewhite97 at gmail.com, or you can get on my website and get my book at coachjoewhiteconsulting.com. Thank you for listening and have a great day. Thank you.